I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with first word news. Vice President-elect Mike Pence now leads Donald Trump's transition team. He replaces embattled New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who last week saw two former aides convicted in the Bridgegate scandal. The Wall Street Journal reports that following his meeting Thursday with President Obama, Mr. Trump is considering leaving parts of the Affordable Care Law in place. The president-elect, who campaigned on a pledge to repeal Obamacare, is said to favor keeping provisions for parents to cover their children and for insurers to cover pre-existing conditions. At least four candidates could be in line to head the Democratic National Committee. The Boston Globe says Vice Chairman Ray Buckley is considering a run for the top spot. Former DNC Chair Howard Dean says he wants his old job back. Minnesota Congressman Keith Ellison is expected to make an announcement on Monday. And former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley is said to be interested. For his final time in office, President Obama led the nation in observing Veterans Day. In remarks at Arlington National Cemetery, the president said of those who have served and are serving in the U.S. Armed Forces, quote, we owe you our thanks, our respect, and we owe you our freedom. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. Bloomberg Technology is next. Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, big tech is down for the third consecutive day after Trump's Tuesday triumph. We'll break down the reasons why the sector appears to have hit a wall. Plus, Alibaba celebrates the single life in China to the tune of $17 billion. We'll discuss the shopping frenzy affectionately called Singles Day. And Mark Zuckerberg comes out swinging the Facebook CEO blasting critics who claim Facebook swung the election Trump's way. First to our lead, investors scratch their heads over what a Donald Trump presidency will mean for business. Remember, stocks started the week with a rally fueled by enthusiasm for a Clinton win. And after a one hour plunge in extended trading on election night, stocks posted equally big gains Wednesday and Thursday as investors warm to Trump's win. But the one sector solidly in the red post-election is tech. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google all down for a third straight day on concerns that Trump's trade policies in particular might cut into big tech's profit. Joining us now for an investor's take, ARK Investment Management CEO Kathy Wood in New York. Kathy runs a handful of tech-focused ETFs. And some of your top holdings, Kathy, are Facebook, Amazon, Tesla, why is tech feeling the brunt of this? Is it because Silicon Valley chose the wrong side? Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think uh, the tech stocks uh, that you featured here have done so well this year, so well during the last few years, that uh, once people understood that we were going to see lower tax rates, deregulation, more of a pro-cyclical market, uh, I, I believe we saw a rotation more towards cyclicals and financials that have been held down by the slow growth economy and by regulation. So I think it was nothing more than that. If uh, Trump is going to make America great again, and uh, I really do agree with these economic policies, I think these stocks are going to continue to have a very good run. But shouldn't Trump's thoughts on deregulation, shouldn't that spill over into the tech industry? I mean, there are some uh, parts of his potential uh, speculated policies that could actually benefit uh, a lot of these companies, including his tax plan. Absolutely, absolutely. These are pro-growth policies and these are growth stocks. So um, we're, we're very uh, encouraged by what we're hearing. Uh, there was a stock today that I think illustrates what the potential of you know this whole sector is. NVIDIA was up almost 30% today and it had already done very, very well. But uh, people are beginning to see how, uh, analysts, investors are beginning to see how uh, gaming has re-accelerated here because of esports. Machine learning is really powerful powering the data center space. Uh, autonomous vehicles, NVIDIA is going to be the central nervous system. Uh, we've got deregulation that's going to encourage all of these trends, and we think NVIDIA is in the sweet spot. It reported earnings, the stock reported, and we, uh, uh, the, the stock responded, and we think that's a leading indicator for the whole sector. 
I know NVIDIA is one of your larger tech holdings. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around how things like trade, uh, immigration, and Trump's views on all of these might impact the tech community. Look, Silicon Valley spent eight years building a very strong bridge with the Obama administration. Uh, with the White House very much embraced technology. Uh, do you have any concern that when Google or Facebook wants something done, wants uh, federal laws implemented one way or another, they're not going to succeed? Well, I do think one of the messages we're getting from these early days from Trump is that traditional lobbying is probably not going to work. He really is going to try and do the right thing from a free market point of view, uh, to the extent he has control over this. Of course, we've got the Congress behind him. He does have a Republican Congress. Uh, so I think in terms of trade, the fact that we have a Republican Congress, most of most Republicans are free trade oriented. I think, uh, uh, I think that Trump's position will be uh, shifting more towards fair trade, fair and free, as opposed to shutting down trade. So I think that's going to be very important. And what about M&A? We're getting some mixed sort of signals. He had said he, he wasn't uh, really a fan of the AT&T Time Warner deal, and yet uh, there are there's some thinking that he might be uh, more in favor of M&A in general, or that, that the FCC, a Republican FCC, might be more lenient on M&A in, in that area. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, I think he's going to let the markets work. Uh, in terms of the the AT and T Time Warner, I think he's concerned of uh, concerned about uh, media consolidation. Uh, uh, given, uh, I guess, the way the media he felt the media treated him uh, during the campaign season, so I think that was more of a one-off than uh, his general position. All right. Well. Uh, lots to be determined over the next weeks and months. Kathy Wood of ARK Investment Management in New York. Kathy, always great to have you here Thanks, on the Emily. show. Thanks, Emily. Thank you very much. Now, as we've been discussing, concerns about President-elect Trump's trade and immigration policies are weighing heavily on the tech industry, which for the most part was blindsided by his victory. Internet companies gave to Hillary Clinton's campaign at 114 times the level they did for Trump, according to some estimates. And on Thursday at the Techonomy Conference in Half Moon Bay, I caught up with BlackBerry CEO John Chen, a Republican who advised President George W. Bush. He shared mixed views on the incoming president. Here he is, reacting to Trump's vow to do away with H-1B visas. If he sit down and look at stack, and I hope he is a businessman enough to do so, uh, then he will know that, you know, ending H-1B um, will really hurt literally across the board for all the tech industry. But when it comes to Trump's protectionist views and suggestion of a 45 percent tariff on Chinese imports, Chen did not think Trump would follow through. I don't think so, likely. I, I, it hurts everybody. I, nobody, I, I'm sorry to say this, but I don't think, I don't think anybody is that dumb. I, 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 you know, what do I know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if, from, if, I, if you want to be logical, you want to be a business person, you look at the well-being of everybody, including your own people. Ending trade war in a globalized system that way we have today, it is absolutely um, devastating, uh, say the least. Uh, it will put the whole world into a recession that probably is going to be very hard to get out. BlackBerry CEO John Chen there. And we will bring you more reactions from Silicon Valley leaders throughout the hour, including Mark Zuckerberg on Facebook's role in informing U.S. voters this election. Coming up, we pick up on some of those themes with Alibaba President Mike Evans. We spoke to him on the Chinese e-commerce giant's most important day of the year, Singles Day. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg. Alibaba has done it again. The Chinese e-commerce giant toppling its singles day record. Sales on the site over the 24-hour promotional period climbing 32 percent to almost 121 billion yuan. That is about 17.8 billion U.S. dollars. Earlier I spoke with Alibaba President Mike Evans from the event in Shenzhen and asked him about the Shopathon's success. The absolute dollar value or renminbi value of what we're selling on the platform today is not the most important thing. What we're really focused on are the 
thousands, hundreds of thousands of brands that are selling products on the platform and the experience that they're having in connecting directly to consumers. And we are also very focused on consumers where we're experimenting with new ways for them to interact with brands through AR, through VR, through live streaming, and all sorts of uh, different ways that we have not tried in the past. So this has been fun for consumers. It's been engaging and tremendously educational for brands. For us, we're realizing and having an opportunity to see the strength and the resilience of our platform, whether it's in payments or logistics, where we're going to have to deliver more than 600 million packages. We're processing orders at 170,000 per second. We're processing payments at 120,000 per second. So this is a great test of the resiliency. And as you know, in my responsibilities for building Alibaba globally, we're going to need a platform with this capabilities in order to make that happen. Let's talk about your global ambitions. One of the goals this year wasn't just to attract international brands, but to attract consumers from outside of China. How much did they uh, make up of sales this year? This year, for the first time, we're making a, a big push outside of China to markets like Taiwan and Hong Kong, but also into Southeast Asia, where we bought a platform called Lazada. Um, that's going very well. As you know, we have our AliExpress business, which continues to sell products from Chinese uh, uh, small businesses to more than 200 uh, countries globally. That is also going well. So this is not about brands from over the world selling things just to China. It's also about Chinese companies companies selling their products to consumers all over the world. Now, last time we spoke, you told me that the Chinese economy is slowing, but not slow. How does Alibaba continue to buck the trend of a slowing Chinese economy? I mean, Singles Day last year, transactions grew by 60 percent. Can you keep that up? Well, it's highly unlikely that we'll continue to grow at 60 percent each year because the absolute number is coming, becoming so large that that would be uh, very, very difficult to do. But as you can see, we're at least 30 plus percent higher than we were last year. And it looks like we'll end up somewhere between 17 and 18 billion dollars of total GMV. Bear in mind that that's against a 9 percent depreciation in the renminbi. So that takes quite a lot out of the dollar number. So it'll be more like 33 or 34 percent from a renminbi standpoint. But the real opportunity is that we're only today penetrating about 10 percent of the China retail market on offline, online. And so there's huge potential growth in that China market, together with everything that we're planning to do as part of our globalization initiative. So we see substantial further opportunity for growth in the future. Bloomberg reported that Trump's trade policies might pose the biggest threat to Alibaba of all the Chinese tech giants. I mean, how would Alibaba respond to potential trade tariff sanctions, even in a very extreme case, a trade war? Well, remember, Emily, that uh, the way that we're currently set up is that we don't actually sell that much product into the United States. But if you want to know who the number one beneficiary is of 11 and 11 in our global shopping festival this year, the U.S. has the largest number of brands that are selling products to the Chinese consumer and to other consumers around the world. Number one ahead of all other countries. It's hard for me to understand or hard for me to imagine a reason why we wouldn't want that to continue. It's great for brands. It's great for real, uh, retailers like Macy's and Costco. It's fantastic for job creation, wealth creation, and all the things that Trump and many presidents are focused on. Alibaba President Mike Evans there. For more now on China's biggest shopping event, I want to bring in GGV Capital Managing Partner Hans Tung and Bloomberg Tech Reporter Selena Wang, who covers Alibaba for us. Hans, I'll start with you. You know, what do you think of the results this year, thinking about it in the context of a slowing economy? Right. I'm not surprised because it's about three things. One, it's about uh, cross-border. You see a lot more U.S. brands selling into China. You see Chinese consumers increasing one more westernized brands. And you see that uh, consumers in Taiwan and, and, and Hong Kong outside of China are buying Chinese goods. Second thing you see is that shopping as entertainment. Um, offline shopping is kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Online shopping, you have live streaming, you have VR. It's, you have stars from the, from the West, from Hollywood. It makes it a lot more fun. And then the third thing is mobile. 70% uh, of the, the uh, transactions are happening on mobile for Alibaba. And that's just shifting the last four years. And so it's, it's, it's what we have been saying, talking about the last three years on the show. 
Now, Celine, obviously one of the goals of Singles Day has been to bring in not just international brands, but international consumers. I didn't get a straight answer on uh, how much uh, uh, of the sales uh, were accounted for, you know, how many outside of China. Any idea, uh, you know, how much success they're actually seeing there? As Mike Evans said in that interview earlier, the vast proportion of the sales are from uh, Chinese consumers themselves. They do have the AliExpress platform, but it's a relatively small one, very small in the U.S. In fact, I have not received the breakdown quite yet. But I think a big theme of this year's Singles Day that you heard over and over again from Mike Evans and Jack Ma is we don't want to just focus on the GMV numbers. Uh, it did slow by uh, went from 60 percent to 30 percent. They know that they will eventually read a point of saturation. They don't want that to be fo the focus, and they want the focus to be what Hans had mentioned earlier, this mix of e-commerce and entertainment and social. Now, Hans, you've been uh, involved with Alibaba from very, very early on, and I'm curious what you think about a Trump presidency, how you really think it could impact Alibaba and uh, our relationship with China. I think in general what will happen is that it would, no matter what happened on the trade side, um, the company that can bypass the middleman, increase efficiency in the supply chain, can withstand any increased costs in transactions. Um, it's surely to tell what uh, President Trump-elect is going to do, but uh, it seems like getting a fair trade um, instead of stop, do stop down trade is more the direction where it's going. So again, we favor companies that can bypass the middleman, increase efficiency in the supply chain to be able to do well over the next four years. Yeah, Selena, sort of explain this idea that Alibaba, as Bloomberg has reported, would be uh, perhaps dis disproportionately affected by uh, Trump's, at least the policies that he's, he's discussed and not implemented yet, uh, but that Alibaba would suffer more than Baidu or Tencent. Why? Between Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, Alibaba has the most significant portion of their, of their business where there's cross-border flow of goods. Uh, there are, even though it's a smaller proportion, there are uh, U.S. consumers purchasing from the wholesale platform, from uh, the, the retail platform, and there are people in China uh, consuming goods from the U.S. So if uh, Donald Trump actually implemented some of the things he had said on the campaign trail, for instance, slapping tariffs on China that are as high as 45 percent, that would have a devastating impact on Chinese companies. But it would also have a devastating impact likely on U.S. companies, because if that tariff were implemented, China would probably retaliate, and that would increase the cost of goods for consumers around the world. Hans, John Chen, CEO of BlackBerry, said earlier that uh, Escalation to a trade war would be completely dumb. Um, do you, what do you, do you realistically think that Trump is going to, uh, you know, impose these tariffs, impose these sanctions? Um, do you think he will go to that extent? As a former businessman, and he has done a lot of business across the world, you can tell that you know Chinese consumption is the single biggest driver of growth worldwide. Um, a lot of American brands will benefit from selling to that. We're investing in Airbnb. They're doing extremely well in, in, in China. We see more and more companies from the U.S. will benefit from that consumption. So I think any administration would uh, figure out a way to make the trade more beneficial for U.S. rather than have a complete stop down. And is it true that you predicted a Trump win? Someone told me that. <laughs> it's uh, easy uh, to say uh, after the fact. I don't have evidence of it, but that's what I heard. A year and, uh, a year and quarter ago, we did have an internal discussion. And... Um, it's, uh, we, we thought Trump had a, had a good chance of, of, of winning. Uh, we may have personal feelings, that's, that's, that's a separate issue, uh -huh. but uh, there, there seemed to be a move to be in there for some, some, some kind of correction. Well, you are right. Hans Tung <laughs> of, of GGV, always great to have you here on the show. Selena Wang, uh, who covers Alibaba for us, thank you as well. Coming up, venture capitalist Peter Thiel to join President-elect Trump's transition team. We will break down what it means for the administration's relationship with Silicon Valley. This is Bloomberg. Peter Thiel's long bet on Donald Trump is paying off. The venture capitalist has been enlisted to President-elect's transition, President Trump's transition team the move solidifying the Facebook board member's power, and it could help Silicon Valley have a say in the next administration. Joining me now from New York, Bloomberg Business Week's Zach Meider. And Zach, uh, we've gotten to know Peter Thiel fairly well on this show. What do you imagine his actual role on the Trump transition team will be? How big a voice will he and his contrarian views have? 
Well, it's, it's hard to say right at the moment, but what happened today was that uh, Teal was named to a 16-member executive committee of the transition team. So he wasn't put in charge of a specific department or policy area, but he was named to a group of almost kind of like an inner circle of top Trump advisors. Other members of that team include uh, Trump's children, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who's very influential, his campaign CEO, Stephen Bannon. So these are people who are very important and will probably be expected to have a sort of broad overarching uh, um, voice in the direction of his transition. Now, we, we've talked a lot about how Silicon Valley has been so vocally against Donald Trump, and Peter Thiel was sort of a lone wolf in his support for Donald Trump. Do you think that uh, Peter Thiel will become the center of a Silicon Valley connection to Washington, or that a big chill could really set in uh, between uh, the Valley and the White House? It's hard to say, you know, the, um, so many aspects of Trump's policies are just to be determined. Even, even where he's, he's been public about uh, taking a position on something, he's often taken a contrary position at another time. And depending on which advisor you ask, you might get a different story. So there's so much of this whole transition that we still don't know yet. But one thing we, we can say for sure is that, you know, a big part of the uh, Silicon Valley's um, concern about Donald Trump was his stance on immigration. Uh, that, you know, that's something that Thiel hasn't really talked about much either way. His support for Trump, uh, he's talked about um, his opposition to getting into more foreign conflicts. He thinks Trump will keep us out of foreign wars. And he's also clearly, he's someone, even though he's, he was the first openly gay person ever to address the Republican convention, uh, he said that he's not interested in sort of identity politics and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, he, he said, I'm proud to be gay, proud to be Republican, but I'm most proud to be an American. Uh, last question, Zach, quickly. How is the rest of the transition team shaping up? We know Vice President Mike Pence will be leading, leading this team, uh, but talk to us about the, little vo the, the other voices that are developing. Sure. I mean, just because you're on the transition team doesn't mean you're going to have a role in the administration. Uh, some of these people are expected to just kind of pick others and step aside. Um, but you have to imagine that, that some of the people who have been his, his closest, most, most um, in the trenches with Donald Trump over the past two years are going to be playing a big role in his administration. People like Rudy Giuliani uh, and, um, you know, Newt Gingrich, uh, Steve Bannon, uh, Reince Priebus, okay. the head of the RNC chairmanship. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, I know you'll keep us posted. Zach Meider of Bloomberg Business Week, thanks so much for giving us that update. Glad to be here. Coming up, Mark Zuckerberg speaks out about claims that fake news in Facebook's news feed played a role in the election results. We will hear from him next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President-elect Donald Trump is rewarding members of his inner circle. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, one of Mr. Trump's most vocal supporters, is expected to land either a cabinet position or a senior advisory role. I have no expectation. All I do is give my advice. Donald's been my friend for 28 years. All of my uh, work on behalf of him has been out of great loyalty and friendship to him. I can see already how he is going to be a great president, and I'm glad I could play a small role. Vice President-elect Mike Pence will serve as chairman of the presidential transition team. Dr. Ben Carson, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, and former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich will join the team's executive committee as vice chairs. A Trump presidency could mean a reset of relations between the U.S. and Ukraine. President Petro Poroshenko says he hopes the new administration will be a strong supporter. The Eastern European country has received U.S. diplomatic support since Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. President-elect Trump has spoken glowingly about Vladimir Putin on numerous occasions. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker says President-elect Trump needs to take lessons on Europe. 
Juncker says Trump once called Belgium a village somewhere far away and alleged Americans as a whole have no interest in the continent. Juncker says Trump needs to be taught the principles by which Europe functions. He says there will be two years of lost time until Trump takes the time to travel the world. President Obama says there are lessons a divided nation can learn from its military. As he led his final Veterans Day observances at Arlington National Cemetery, the president said Americans should follow the example of those who serve by being united in what he called our great diversity. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen who represent every corner of our country, every shade of humanity, immigrant and native-born, Christian, Muslim, Jew, and non-believer alike, all forged into common service. The president urged citizens to reconnect with, in his words, the principles that are more enduring than transitory politics. Russia could be on the verge of creating its own internet independent from the World Wide Web. That's according to the country's communication ministry, which says the Kremlin might make the move to tighten control over cross-data border exchanges. The ministry's plan also calls for regulating domains, IP addresses, and points of traffic exchange. Actor Robert Vaughn is dead. The cause, acute leukemia. Vaughn was best known for his starring role in the television series The Man from UNCLE. Robert Vaughn was 83. From New York, I'm Mark Crompton. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is speaking out against the idea that fake news on the social network influenced the U.S. presidential election. Speaking at Techonomy's annual conference in Half Moon Bay, just south of San Francisco, he pushed back against critics who say Facebook let false information run rampant on its site and that its algorithm tended to amplify the voices people wanted to hear instead of providing a full picture of what was going on. He told our Bloomberg contributing editor David Kirkpatrick that echo chambers aren't really a problem on the site. Take a listen. When it comes to newsfeed ranking, I actually think we're very transparent. Every time we add a new signal or make a change, we publish that, right? And we explain why we're doing it and what signal we're adding, and we bring people in to talk to them about it. So, you know, that, that stuff is out there, and, and we'll continue to do that. I mean, that's a, that's a, big, um, that's a big part of what we do, and, and we take that seriously. Um, you know, I, I've seen some of the stories that you're talking about around this election. You know, personally, I think... Uh, the the idea that uh, you know fake news on Facebook, uh, of which you know it's a it's a very small amount of of, um, of the content, uh, influenced the in the election in any way, I think, is a, a pretty crazy idea, right? And it's um, you know voters make decisions based on their lived experience, right? I mean, they you kind of. One part of this that I think is important is we really believe in, in people, right? And, and that they can, like, you don't generally go wrong when you trust that people understand what they care about and what's important to them, and, uh, and you build systems that reflect that. And, you know, part of what I think is going on here is people are trying to understand the result of the election. Um, but I do think that there is a certain uh, profound lack of empathy in asserting that the only reason why someone could have voted the way they did is because they saw some fake news. Right? I think if, if, if you believe that, um, then I don't think you have internalized the message that Trump supporters are trying to send in, in this election. And which, just is, to, to, which is what? What would you say? Well, well let, me, let me finish on this for, for a second. The, you know, and and the, the quickest way to, I think, refute the fact that this surely had no impact is, um, you know, why would you think that there would be fake news on one side but not on the other? Yeah. Right? So, I mean, we know, we study this. Um, we know that it's a very small volume of anything. You know, hoaxes aren't new on Facebook, right? I mean, it's, you know, there have been hoaxes on the Internet. And there were hoaxes before. And we, we do our best to, to make it so that people can, uh, can report that. And, um, and, and so that we can, as I said before, show people the most meaningful content that, that we can. But, you know, I think that the idea that... Um, 
that 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 in, had any impact in the election is. Well, is, is pretty, I don't. I actually don't disagree with you on that. Although it's interesting, several of the tech journalists who happen to be here today specifically mention it as something that's of concern to them right now. So I think they'll be glad you commented on it. But what about the idea of the filter bubble, which is a bigger concept that I think is yeah. one that people talk about all the time. I mean, yeah. I am something of a Facebook expert, as you know, and. I'm often talking to people about Facebook, and I can't tell you how often they want to talk about this idea that they believe passionately yeah. that somehow yeah. it's distorting the way the world works. Well, look, I mean, we've studied this a lot because, I mean, you can imagine, I, I really care about this, right? I, I, know I want what we do to have a, a, a good impact on the world. Um, I, I, I want people to have a diversity of information. So, you know, this is why we study this stuff to make sure we're, we're having that positive impact. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, so the, all the research that we have suggests that, that this isn't really a problem. Um, and I can go into that in a second, but for whatever reason, we've, we've had a really hard time getting that out. But, yeah. um, but here, here's the, the historical analogy that I think is, is useful on this. If you go back, uh, you know, 20 years and, and look at the media landscape, there were a few major TV networks, right? In any given local area, there were a few major newspapers that each had uh, a, an editorial opinion, and those were your, your opinions, right? That, that you basically, you, you got all your news filtered through that. That's now, the opinions you received from yeah, the media. Through, yeah, through that. Yeah. Now, you know, regardless of um, what leaning you have on, on Facebook politically or what your background is, the, you know, all the research would show that you know, almost everyone has some friends who are on the other side. Right, so even if 90% of your friends, even if you're a Democrat and 90% of your friends are Democrats, you probably have 10% of your friends are Republicans. That's what you, your research yes, has found? absolutely. Yeah. Right, and you know, even if you, you live in some state or some country, you're, you're going to know some people who live in another state or another city or another country. Um, That's encouraging because a lot of people I know say, I don't know anybody who supports the other person. I happen to, so it's nice, but, but I'm glad you said that. Keep going. I mean, I think they probably do, whether, the, whether that person well, is talking they, about it, I think is a different, th is a different that may situation. Be. Okay, but, there you go. Um, you know, so what, what we found, and, and you can go through everything. You can go through religion, you can go through ethnic background, just all, all of these different things, and that kind of diversity is true. I mean, people tend to, you know, even if, even if in, in most cases, or a lot of cases, the majority of, of someone's friends might fit their beliefs, um, there are always some who don't. And that means that the media diversity and diversity of information that you're getting through a social system like Facebook um, is going to be inherently more diverse than what you would have gotten from you know, watching one of the three news stations mm. um, and sticking with that and having that be your newspaper or your TV station um, 20 years ago. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg there speaking with our Bloomberg contributing editor, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick, Sarah Fryer, who covers Facebook with me here now. What do you make of Mark Zuckerberg's comments there? Well, I think that Zuckerberg is making these, these comments that are a little bit against the common opinion about Facebook. I mean, people people have these these experiences on Facebook that affect how they feel about the social network. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I, I do see fake news in my social network, and I do see a lack of of uh, supporters from the other side. Exactly, and, and I see a lot of people who think the way I do. So, so I think that that while this might be what they find in their research, the truth of the matter is they need to admit that they're a media company too, and then take the responsibility for information distribution, which is like the lead purpose of, of Facebook, whether it's information for your family or friends or information from the media, um, they seem to want to distance themselves from that kind of a description of what Facebook is and sort of see themselves as a neutral party just letting people do what they want. Now I had this debate with Keith Raboy of Coastal Ventures and Steve Huffman of Reddit earlier this week where I said Facebook says an algorithm is, is making these decisions and users are making these decisions but the reality is that humans make that algorithm. Absolutely. Uh, should Facebook either take greater responsibility or make some changes uh, to that algorithm based on some of these comments, and they were vehemently said no, that Facebook's news feed is uh, user-determined, algorithm-determined. I think that there's some truth to that. Like, you don't want Facebook to come in and say, we're going to decide what 
what people can and can't think. Obviously, that would be crossing a line. But there are some things that they do already to enhance the quality of news that people get on their network. And, and if you look at the news feed values that they published this, this summer, one of the things that they want to promote is, is genuine content, right? And so even if, as Zuckerberg says, this fake news is, is a small percentage of the articles on Facebook, there are so many things that they could do. The way that they used to improve the general quality of news on Facebook in that they, they derank clickbait and they derank the stories that promise more than they deliver. Um, we've talked about this in, in, in previous years and they could easily do the same with fake news it, where they just it, it's not that they stop letting people share it it's just that they know that their users have a bad experience when they realize they've been duped like right. nobody wants to feel duped right and so if that is what they found in their research which is what they say they found um there it, it seems like they could take a stance that's better than, oh, you know, we don't have any effect on the electorate or the public. Right. It, really interesting conversation there with David Kirkpatrick. If you have a chance, uh, check it out, the full conversation online. Sarah Fryer, uh, who covers Facebook for us, thanks so much for weighing in. More on the election still to come, including few predicted Donald Trump's big win after the break. We will speak to the director of the only major poll that did get it right. This is Bloomberg. Continuing with tech leaders' reaction to the U.S. presidential election this week, website developer GoDaddy has done a lot of work to improve transparency about gender equality in the workplace. I caught up with CEO Blake Irving at the Techonomy Conference in Half Moon Bay and asked him if Hillary Clinton couldn't break the highest glass ceiling in the nation. Is it because society doesn't want to see women leaders succeed? I don't think so. I, I, I believe that... It's not a predisposition of the American people to say, I don't want to see a woman in that seat. I mean, the, what went down over the last campaign trail was, was pr pretty, pretty unusual. And I don't think that was about you're a man or a woman. I think those were just diametrically opposed positions. Uh, in tech, which is where I've been putting my focus, th there's, there's clearly a problem both at the pipeline level and, gee, how attractive is that role once I'm in it. And so we've been p putting a lot of effort into making sure that all the, all the data that we have is transparent, not just in how many women we have versus men, and we're basically smack dab in the middle of the 21% that is the, the, industry, the, the average. industry average today. But we've actually gone as far as actually publishing our salary data on how much women make versus men across engineering pipelines. So we actually show, we also show what attrition looks like for women. And one of the largest problems that we have in tech is that women actually attrit out of the roles as they become more senior because, you know, the, the business isn't flexible enough, the environment doesn't feel like it's appropriate when they have the second child, usually not the first, mm -hmm. where it's really difficult to juggle between two children and a, and a job and, and either the, the husband or the wife or the partner has to decide somebody's going to stay home. Mm -hmm. And the flexibility needs to be there to allow that to be okay, whether it's mm -hmm. whether it's you know, uh, parental leave policy or what happens when you return and then the flex hours that you can offer an employee uh, in in that situation where they have two kids and they're both working parents, which is a pretty typical arrangement now. GoDaddy CEO Blake Irving there. Continuing now with the U.S. election, one of the biggest losers of the campaign was, of course, polling. Almost all the pollsters, political insiders, and predictive models had Hillary Clinton strolling into the White House. All except one. The University of Southern California LA Times poll was the only major poll to see Trump win. The poll's final forecast showed Trump leading by a little more than three points, 46.8% to 43.6%. Joining us now to discuss the poll's innovative approach, or what worked at least, USC Center for Economic and Social Research Survey Director Jill Darling from LA. Jill, thank you so much for joining us. So what do you think was the major differentiator of your poll? Well, our poll is different from traditional polls in several ways, actually. Um, one is that we talked to the same panel of respondents throughout the campaign. Um, and that in, allows us to see actual change taking place among the group of people that we're talking to over time. Traditional polls uh, tend to talk to different people each time they do a poll. And as they're often telephone polls, they have to reach their uh, cohort of respondents 
by telephone, which is a whole different process than when we have a panel lined up and they know they're going to be responding each week. So that's really one of the major differences. Another big difference is in the way that we ask our questions. Um, a traditional poll asks kind of an up and down question, which is if the election were held today, would you vote for Clinton, Trump, or someone else? Um, the way we ask it is we have a probabilistic method. We ask them to give us a percentage from 0 to 100 of the likelihood that they will vote for each one of those candidates. And so what we end up with is an uh, interesting kind of um, measure of not only support for candidates, but also a level of support and a measure of uncertainty. So for an example of how this might play out is one week uh, we might ask somebody, uh, that question and we'd find out they were a hundred percent Clinton supporter and then maybe the Comey FBI emails break and we come back and we ask them the next week and maybe they're now a 75 percent Clinton supporter and if you have enough of those slides accumulating you're going to see that in our charts um, starting to go down if you ask the same voter if they are going to, if they were going to vote today, would they vote for Clinton, Trump, or someone else? They might still say Clinton, or they might at least say they're leaning towards Clinton. Right. So what we have is a way of kind of almost like a fever chart of seeing how people are feeling about the candidate. So and let's so you break can down. See that. Uh, Let's break down some of the actual categories, gender, race, age, because you saw some very interesting trends uh, across various categories. One of the most, one of the deciding factors was white men who sat out in 2012 actually came out to vote. Uh, we've heard a lot about how 53% of white women voted for Trump. What are the trends that you saw? We absolutely did see that, and we found that... Um, that you know, all of the same things that you're seeing in, uh, in, in the exit polls and, and others. And we don't have our, um, our final numbers in yet. We still have one more step in our poll to get the actual vote from the folks that we talked to throughout the campaign season, which will give us an even closer look. But in terms of what people were saying as they were heading towards the polls, we definitely saw that uh, percentages of people who did not vote in 2012 uh, higher percentages than uh, would have normally been expected definitely did come. And those categories are mainly lower educational levels, white, and more in the outside urban regions. So uh, last quick question, you know, your poll didn't get the popular vote right, and in fact had Trump winning the popular vote. Obviously, uh, the rest of the polls were, <laughs> were very wrong in, in other ways, but how do you plan to change your methodology in the future, and how do you think other polls should change their methodology in the future uh, to make sure that the, the country isn't so misled? Well, Quickly. one of the things that, that I, yeah, I think our, our poll actually has an ability to, since we don't use a likely voter model, um, we have everybody who, who um, is an eligible voter is in our poll, and we weight them by their own self-reported propensity to vote. So that way we are able to see if there is a surge among people who uh, might not have voted in the past. It, it's, it's fascinating uh, polling science. I, I know there's going to be a lot of discussion in the industry over the next uh, uh, several months and years. Uh, USC Center for Economic and Social Research Survey Director Jill Darling, thanks so much for joining us. We'll be right back. Now to Bloomberg Studio 1.0, our long-form show where we sit down with the biggest influencers in technology and media. This week, our guest is Susan Wojcicki, CEO of YouTube. I started by asking her why YouTube remains under the alphabet umbrella when some analysts estimate it could be a $70 billion standalone company. You know, it's an important part of Google. Um, and we benefit from a lot of things being part of Google. So first of all, we run on Google infrastructure. And then we also benefit from Google's ad sales team that sells our inventory. Um, but within YouTube, we are a company within Google. And so um, we have all parts that a company has, um, sales, marketing, um, engineering. And so we have some of the benefits of being within Google, um, but then um, are able to be a standalone brand within the company. There are reports that YouTube makes billions of dollars. And still, you recently Said that YouTube is still in investment mode. And I'm curious, how would you describe your goals, Larry Page's goals, CFO Ruth Porat's goals around profit? 
short and long term? Really what you want to focus on is growing the business when you're in a big growth area. Um, and so you have to balance doing that and then doing that in a responsible way. TV, which is one of the biggest markets from any metric, from a subscription number, from a TV ad number, from a watch time, like this is one of the biggest markets we have. And the millennials, we are not seeing them watching as much TV. Mm -hmm. And so we see this as an opportunity to invest and continue to grow the product and continue to grow YouTube to be a great experience. So we need to do that in a responsible way, um, but we're definitely in investment mode. According to a recent Piper Jaffray survey, for the first time, teens are watching more YouTube than cable. 26% saying they watch YouTube every day compared to 25% for cable, compared to 37% for Netflix. What do the demographics actually look like? Because some people say YouTube focuses too much on younger users. Mm -hmm. Well, to get a billion users to come to your site every month, you need people from all demographics. Um, and so if you look at any demo, um, we have a very significant number of users. But um, I do think if you look at the, the millennial audience, you do see their behavior really shifting um, from traditional TV to online. And so mobile, I think, is really driving a lot more usage. And also the on-demand. So this is, a, this is a generation that has grown up expecting. Of course, they should be able to see whatever show they want whenever they want. Susan Wojcicki, CEO of YouTube. You can catch the full interview Sunday on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, airing 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology and this very long week. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology now live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekday, 6 p.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now from San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.